this is Steve Tunnell, and today we're lucky enough to have Rob Chapburn join us to talk about the taxonomy of ventilation. It's a, it's a subject I've been eager to hear about, it's a subject I believe in strongly. And so with that being said, Rob, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, take it away? Okay, well, um, I, uh, well, let me just share my screen here and I'll just jump into it and you'll see my name and my position and I can use that as a jumping off point. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Well, um, my name is Rob Chapburn. Uh, I'm currently um, Program Manager of Respiratory Care Research for the Enterprise at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, formerly, I was the Director of Respiratory Care at University Hospitals in Cleveland. I've been in the field for over four decades. I like to say nearly half a century. <laughs> so uh, I'm also a professor in the Department of Medicine at the Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve. And uh, here's my standard disclosure and disclaimer. I am a paid consultant for a number of different companies uh, associated with mechanical ventilation. I want to emphasize that any opinions that I express are my own and do not represent those of the Cleveland Clinic. Now, getting into this topic about taxonomy, uh, what we, we use this to teach our fellows in pulmonary and critical care medicine, uh, as well as the respiratory therapists. And we like to tell them, just come at this with an open mind and forget about what you think you know about mechanical ventilation and be prepared to learn some new terms and some new concepts. And the word taxonomy itself is somewhat unfamiliar, particularly to respiratory therapists, I think, and it just means a classification system, and not to be confused with taxidermy, which is a whole other thing, right? And that reminds me of a joke. How about this? The crossover veterinary clinic and taxidermy shop. Their motto is, either way it goes, you get your dog back. I've been working on this for about 25 years. Then in fact, I actually did my master's thesis on developing this taxonomy and I've received a fair amount of pushback over the years. And it's mostly from people that have been in the industry for such a long time that they think they already understand everything. But the complexity of our world and the complexity of mechanical ventilation technolo technology has grown so much that uh, they probably haven't kept up. Therefore, I want to set the stage by talking about what is good about a taxonomy. Well, first of all, it's a conceptual basis for learning how ventilators work, just the technology of mechanical ventilation. It allows us to identify and compare modes of ventilation, just like taxonomies for other things allow us to do the similar types of things. And then if we can identify and compare modes, we're in a position to choose the most appropriate mode for our patients. And above all, it provides a means of communicating amongst clinicians and educators and researchers. And most recently, we've been working on how we can incorporate this into our electronic medical uh, record for writing orders for mechanical ventilation. And finally, it's a theoretical basis for interpreting uh, ventilator waveforms, which is a topic that everybody's interested in and nobody can really learn enough about. This provides us with a means for recognizing and solving problems clear back to actually designing ventilators and designing new modes and hopefully better modes for the future. And if you think about it, this taxonomy just provides us the same general benefits of a drug taxonomy. And where would we be without generic drug names? Now, again, I wanna set the overall context for this um, by talking about the evolution of technology in the field of mechanical ventilation. Uh, I've been around since the late 1970s, and I've lived through just about every generation of mechanical ventilation. The first generation, let us say those were the negative pressure ventilators that arose out of the polio epidemics. But by the time I got into the field, <clears throat> we are onto the second generation of positive pressure mechanical ventilators. And those of you who have been around a while know what ventilator this is, right? <laughs> this is old Puritan Bennett MA1. Uh, the third generation was when microprocessors first became uh, available commercially and relatively cheaply. Those were put into ventilators. Uh, and then the fourth generation went to, um, got away from standard um, or simple, that I should say, digital displays into graphic displays using CRTs and LCD screens. <clears throat> 
that led up to the fifth generation where we had multiple screens and more complicated software for both controlling the ventilator and for, uh, I, in, I would say, analyzing the patient ventilator interaction. In other words, pressure, volume, and flow. And now we are up at the sixth generation and we have literally dozens of screens, um, many, many different capabilities for optimizing settings and analyzing patient ventilator interaction clear on up to and including metabolic measurements. Now the point is that just in the course of one human lifetime, one, one professional lifetime, if you will, the technology of mechanical ventilation has increased in complexity exponentially. Whereas the resources we have spent on educating clinicians about this technology has been flat at best. So that implies that we're having a growing knowledge gap that happens on a daily basis. And so there's a, a greater and greater need to come up with a standardized way to understand and to teach mechanical ventilation. And that's what this taxonomy really is all about. Just to give you another perspective, when I started the field back in the late 70s, uh, one of my textbooks was the very first book on respiratory therapy equipment. About half of that book was dedicated to, to uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, and amazingly enough, only three modes were listed in this whole book. Assist, control, assist control. I suppose maybe you could find CPAP in there if you want to call that a mode. Fast forward to today. This is the most recent respiratory care book on uh, equipment. Again, about over at least half of the book is on mechanical ventilation. And you can find nearly 300 different names for modes. Now, do you think that's a problem? I do, because that only represents about four dozen actually different modes. And so there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of confusion. How do we deal with this? Well, we need to adopt a new paradigm and we need to develop a set of skills. And these skills start off with memorizing some key terms, a set of terms that I call a standardized vocabulary. That's, that's something that we use in the, in the science of taxonomy. And um, those key terms then are used to define um, what I call the 10 maxims of ventilator technology. These are 10 basic concepts of how ventilators are designed and how they interact with the patient. And those 10 basic maxims start off from very simple, obvious concepts up to very complex concepts that ultimately lead us to a, a complete taxonomy of modes. And once we have this taxonomy, then we are in a position to classify all available modes currently and anything that could come out in the future. And people can learn to do this themselves. You can just read the operator's manual and explain for yourself what the ventilator modes are how they're classified independent of what manufacturers would like you to believe. And once you can do that, then just like for drugs, you can see which modes are the same, which ones are different and know their strengths and weaknesses. You can compare the modes in terms of how they serve the goals of mechanical ventilation and safety, comfort and liberation. And then hopefully at the end of the day, you'll be able to use modes appropriately. And those of you who are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, of education, you'll see that this corresponds to that. So it does make a, a very beautiful learning structure for teaching mechanical ventilation. Now, as I mentioned, I've been working on this uh, taxonomy and this way of looking at mechanical ventilation for about 25 years. In the course of that time, all of these textbooks, these are the major textbooks that are used by clinicians to teach mechanical ventilation to students. All of these textbooks have adopted this system and they all say the same thing. So that is uh, uh, an immensely practical uh, aid for us in moving forward and adopting this. Okay, I wanna just briefly jump into this um, concept of these 10 fundamental maxims because these are the concepts that build up to the taxonomy itself. And then I'll show you what you do with the taxonomy. But essentially the first maxim is that um, because a ventilator is designed to deliver breaths to patients, then we need to know how the ventilator actually defines a breath. And the convention is that we define it in terms of the flow waveform. And by convention, flow in the positive direction, you see here in green, represents inspiration. Flow in the negative direction represents expiration. 
And if we think about it in terms of a flow time waveform, like as you might see on a ventilator, then the horizontal axis is time. And we can divide up that time axis into various intervals that are important to us because they end up being uh, relevant ventilator settings. Now, the second maxim has to do with this concept of what is an assisted breath. And again, this is something that we need to rethink um, what most people understand. And if we, if we agree that a ventilator can be defined as an automatic device that is designed to perform some portion of the work necessary to achieve adequate gas exchange, then we can say that an assisted breath is one for which the goal of the work necessary to ventilate the lungs. Um, therefore, an unassisted breath means the ventilator does nothing, something like CPAP. And the patient has to do all of the work of breathing. We might still put a patient on a ventilator to do that. Let's say a premature infant goes on CPAP to gain and grow, things like that. And at the other end of the spectrum, if we don't choose the mode and the settings appropriately, then there can be uh, synchrony problems between the patient and the ventilator. And therefore the patient ends up doing work on the ventilator. We call that a loaded breath. I keep using this term work. If you re remember your high school physics, work is defined as force acting through a distance. In physiologic terms, it means basically pressure um, necessary to deliver volume. It's actually the integral of volume with, res I mean, integral of pressure with respect to volume. But for, for constant pressure, we can simply say it's pressure times volume, simplify things. Now, how do we recognize assisted breaths at the bedside? Well, if we look at the flow waveform, then we can see when inspiration begins and ends. And then we look up at the pressure waveform. And if airway pressure rises above baseline, then that's the definition of an assisted breath. It is, of course, possible for to, to be uh, in an inspiration without any change in pressure. We would call that an unassisted breath, graphically. And in the real world, no ventilator is a perfect pressure controller, so that even the best CPAP machines, as the patient inspires, there's a slight drop in pressure below baseline and it's, uh, during inspiration and a slight rise during expiration. So there is always some slight amount of work that the patient does, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, the patient has to do a little bit of work just to communicate to the ventilator when to trigger inspiration. Now, to go any further down this road of the 10 maxims, we need to go off into the weeds a little bit and talk about how we understand patient ventilator interaction in terms of a model. We need a model because the ventilatory system in terms of its mechanics is a very complex system of tubes and elastic chambers. We can simplify all this uh, with well, what's called a single compartment model of the lungs, which is just a flow conducting tube uh, attached to elastic uh, compartment representing the airways and the, and the chest wall. And the reason why we do this is because it allows us to make simple measurements like a volume and flow and the change in pressure difference across the system. And these three variables are all we need to describe the mechanical properties of the system such as resistance, which is a relationship between pressure change and flow change, or elastance, which is the relationship between pressure and volume. Or sometimes we talk about compliance was just the reciprocal of that, which is ever more convenient. Now, these are basic definitions that anybody who wants to understand mechanical ventilation needs to commit to memory. Now, we know that during mechanical ventilation, pressure, volume, and flow are all continuous variables of time. And we want to relate them together in a more general model that is called the equation of motion for the respiratory system. It simply says that the pressure to cause inspiration has these two components. One is elastance times volume, and the other is resistance times flow. And by the way, this little dot here is a mathematical symbol borrowed from calculus. And the truth is, this is a differential equation. It's a linear differential equation with constant coefficients, meaning the elastance and resistance are constant. If you really want to master this uh, mechanical ventilation at a world-class level, you have to understand at least enough calculus to know the derivation of this and how it can be used to derive other equations. But 
that is an aside. This term here, elastance times volume, has the units of pressure, and we call it the elastic load, whereas this term here is resistance times uh, flow, also has units of pressure, and we call that the resistive load. So we have pressure on the left-hand side and these two components of pressure on the right-hand side. Now, a more complete version of the equation of motion accounts for the fact that most patients on ventilators are actively breathing, which means we have to have another term over here that represents the force generated by the ventilatory muscles. We call that muscle pressure or PMUS. So PMUS plus PVET sum give the pressure that is the impedance to these loads, uh, to these forces. And we can think of the ventilator as the P vent, the pressure generated by the ventilator pushing gas into the lungs. And I suppose we could also think of P must as a pressure generated inside the patient that helps to pull in um, gas. Now, the third maxim uh, is the most important of all. And that tells us that the ventilator provides assistance. It actually does work on the ventilator, on the patient by controlling either one side of the equation or the other. So for example, we say pressure control. What it means is that you as the operator set the parameters of the pressure waveform, things like inspiratory pressure, inspiratory time, and things like that. In contrast, volume control means something entirely different. That's the entire opposite way to construct a mode of ventilation. And because there are two variables on this side of the equation, Volume control by definition means that both tidal volume and inspiratory flow are preset. If the mode allows you to only set one of these things, it's not volume control. It turns out to be some form of pressure control. Now, if we take a look at volume control and pressure control in terms of graphic, graphical representations, as you might see on a mechanical ventilator, then we see here the classic case of a constant inspiratory flow leading to a linear rise in volume and by the way, the area between the flow time curve is volume. And for the pressure, we see this initial rise in pressure. And then we increase our linear increase in pressure in the container. In fact, the slope of this is proportional to elastics. In contrast, pressure control means that we control airway pressure. In the classical example here, we have a a constant inspiratory pressure, and the lungs uh, passively respond as an exponential decay in flow from a peak value, which is equal to this change divided by resistance, full, such that the pressure at the airway is the same as the pressure in the lungs, and therefore there's no pressure differential to cause flow, flow is zero. And the only pressure that is left then is the elastic reflow. And in fact, these exponential curves can be described in terms of what's called a time constant, another very important concept in understanding mechanical ventilation, but we don't have time to go into that now. The question becomes, how does the equation of motions help us to understand patient ventilator interaction? Well, we can describe that by starting off with volume control, which is perhaps the most, still the most commonly used mode in the world. Here we see the equation of motion for a passive patient. There's no PMUS. And then underneath there we see these classical or idealized waveforms for pressure, volume, and flow. Now we say that the patient gets ill. Why, what does that mean? Well, the elastance and or resistance increases. What's that going to do? Is it going to affect volume and flow delivery to the patient? Well, the answer is no, because this is volume control. And we have said that the definition of volume of control is that volume and flow are preset. What that means is that the only thing that can give to keep this equation uh, valid is that um, the ventilator pressure P vent must increase. If resistance increases, this initial pressure rises increases, and if elastance increases, then the slope of this pressure rise increases, and both of which contribute to a higher peak inspiratory pressure. Well, then what happens in pressure control, the opposite way to create a mode? Well, again, if we say that uh, if the elastance or in a resistance increases, then oops, I went backwards, the elastance or resistance increases, will then the pressure waveform be distorted? No, because we said this is pressure control, this is preset. What that means is if this stays constant, then if this increases, 
that has to decrease. If this increases, that has to decrease. So as a patient gets sicker, what you typically see is a lower peak flow because resistance went up. And because the area under the flow waveform is volume, then the tidal volume goes down as well. Those are things we can see at the bedside. And now you say, well, what happens then if the patient gets involved in mechanical ventilation? If the patient is actively inspiring, and we put in this term P must to account for that. That represents inspiratory effort. Okay, let's go back to volume control and see what happens if the patient makes an inspiratory effort causing an increase in muscle pressure. Well, again, this side of the equation is not affected. This side of the equation is. What that means is if this is, remains constant and this term increases, then this term must decrease in order to maintain the equality. What does that look like on the waveform? Well, we get this scooped out pressure waveform that everybody has seen at the bedside. That simply reflects the effect of PMUS. In other words, the patient is doing work. And in fact, clinically, what we can say is that the work that the ventilator was doing before has now been shifted onto the patient. What about pressure control? Well, again, if the patient makes an inspiratory effort, Pressure is not going to be distorted because we're controlling it. So that means if this side of the equation increases, this side of the equation must increase. And what we typically see is a, a rise in peak inspiratory flow and a rise in the tidal volume. So the extra work that is being shifted onto the patient uh, is being displayed in terms of a higher volume and flow. And this whole concept of work is very important when we come to comparing modes. So let's take a look at volume control or what's called volume guarantee, which is pressure control with a, a tidal volume target. And if we plot the work that the ventilator does versus the work that the patient does, then we see that in volume control, as the patient, if the patient does no work, then the ventilator does everything. But as the patient work increases, then that work is shifted to the patient to the point where the patient could literally be doing all the work. And this happens in modes like volume control, uh, volume assist control, and pressure regulated volume control. Well, what happens in pressure control? Well, we know that in pressure control, the airway pressure remains constant. As it turns out, the ventilator work um, in liters and uh, work per liter of, of tidal volume stays constant. And that only leaves then what happens in these modes that are so called proportional modes, like proportional assist and neurally adjusted ventilatory assist. Well, those modes were designed such that as the patient does more work, the ventilator provides more work support. That's why it's called proportional. Now, that's the most complicated part of the 10 maxims. And now we're getting into things that are more or less uh, obvious to people. If the ventilator is going to deliver a breath, it needs to know when to start and stop inspiration. The start of Inspiration is called a trigger event. The ventilator can monitor various signals to know when to do this. Um, the end of the inspiratory time is called the cycle event. And again, the same um, signals are involved. Um, it's important to realize that these trigger and cycle events can be either patient or machine initiated. Machine initiated trigger and cycle can be in terms of time or volume, whereas patient Trigger and cycle events can be initiated by a much larger uh, variety of variables that the ventilator can monitor. Now we come to perhaps the most important concept in the whole taxonomy and the one that causes the most difficulty because manufacturers have led us astray regarding what these terms mean. As I define the breath, uh, spontaneous breath, it means that the patient retains some control over the timing of the breath. That's what spontaneous means. Um, and in terms of the words or the standardized vocabulary I've been talking about, it means that the patient both triggers and cycles inspiration. If the machine gets involved in doing either triggering or cycling, then the patient loses some control over the timing. And we're going to call that a mandatory breath. So the patient, the ventilator can be involved in triggering or cycling or both. Now we can use these important definitions to define what we call breath sequences. In other words, modes 
either deliver mandatory breaths or spontaneous breaths, and there's only three possibilities. First possibility is that these are all mandatory breaths. In other words, spontaneous breaths are not possible, and we call that continuous mandatory ventilation. Now, I know some manufacturers use this as a name of a mode. I'm using it as a generic classification. If both mandatory and spontaneous breaths are possible, and specifically if spontaneous breaths may occur between mandatory breaths, then we will call that intermittent mandatory ventilation for historical reasons. And if all the breaths are spontaneous, then we call that continuous spontaneous ventilation just as sort of the opposite of CMV. Now, another very important concept that very few people seem to be aware of um, is that there are four different kinds of IMV. And those of you who are as old as me remember actually inventing IMV, right? We took old Puritan Bennett machines that only did assist control and we modified them with anesthesia beds so that the patient can breathe spontaneously in between a low mandatory rate. Well, that was type one. And ventilator manufacturers realized that we wanted this. They started to build it. And it was such that you can set a mandatory breath rate. And that was always delivered regardless of what the patient wanted. Now, once ventilators started to move into the home care environment, companies like Respironics said, well, hey, you know, mandatory breaths aren't that great for synchrony. Wouldn't it be better if we had spontaneous breaths all the time, we could assist spontaneous breaths and only have the mandatory breaths come in if the patient got tired or went apnea. And so they invented type two IMV such that if the spontaneous breath rate was higher than the mandatory breath rate that was set, then those spontaneous breaths would suppress the mandatory breaths and you just never see them. They wouldn't become a synchrony problem. And then some brilliant engineers said, well, wait a minute, what happens if the patient's just breathing rapid and shallow, just ventilating the dead space? Then you've lost your safety feature of the mandatory breaths. So they said, okay, then what we need really is if the spontaneous minute ventilation is higher than what's set by the mandatory rate in tidal volume, then the spontaneous minute ventilation can suppress the mandatory breaths again and be good to go. And finally, the fourth method of um, IMV is a direct result of a targeting scheme that we're going to call dual targeting. We'll talk about that in a minute, but this is an advanced form of um, feedback control in which the ventilator can actually switch between volume control and pressure control. And we can see that we will see in a, in a minute here that if the inspiratory effort is large enough, the ventilator switches out of volume control during a breath into pressure control, and that can turn it into a spontaneous breath. We'll talk about that later in a minute. Now, if we start combining these concepts, for example, the idea of a control variable and a breath sequence, then we have a, a crude um, mode classification system that we can call ventilatory patterns. And there's only five of them. There's volume control, CMV and IMV, and pressure control, CMV, IMV, and CSV. And to gain more understanding of how modes operate, we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper into the engineering principles behind them. And that brings up the concept of targeting schemes. In order to understand targeting schemes, you have to understand what a target is. And that's just a predetermined output of the ventilator. There are within breath targets like inspiratory pressure, height of volume, flow, minute ventilation. And there are between breath targets, such as end tidal CO2 and um, saturation by pulse oximetry. Advanced control schemes can set those as goals and adjust the ventilator. Now, what is a targeting scheme? Well, it's basically just a feedback control mechanism. This is something that engineers use all the time for everything um, from power steering in our car to uh, probably how your oven works. And what it does is it simply stabilizes the target output of the ventilator when patient condition changes so that you don't have to be standing there adjusting it manually. It can be done automatically. Now, to understand this sort of graphically what a feedback control system is, Typically, ventilators have historically been what we call open loop systems. So you have uh, a human interacting with the ventilator. The ventilator interacts with the patient. Information is displayed to the, to the human. 
and the human makes all the decisions and, and does all the controls manually. As automation has increased over time, we're starting to see decision support systems, uh, again, which is open loop in the sense that um, we can gather information of the interaction between the patient and the ventilator. We can put that through an artificial intelligence system. That system can then generate recommendations to the human as to how um, the, the ventilator settings should be adjusted. And the human is still in control of whether or not that is being done. But more and more, we're starting to see closed loop control. And what that really means is, at the highest level, is that there's no human involved. And the information of the patient ventilator interaction is, a, is acted upon by the artificial intelligence system, let us say, for example, a rule-based expert system or maybe an artificial neural network. And that automatically uh, adjusts the ventilator in terms of the patient's changing needs. And I've written about this in respiratory care. If you want to know more about the engineering aspects of this, you can take a look at this article. Now, as that as a background, I just want to say that there are seven basic targeting schemes that are used in current modes today. They are evolving over time. This will probably increase. And I'm afraid there's no way around actually memorizing these things if you want to understand the taxonomy. But I'll just go through them very quickly. The first one is called set point. It simply means that there's nothing automatic. All the targets are operator preset. And it's given a symbol here, lowercase s. Then there is dual targeting, which I mentioned before, where the ventilator can switch between volume control and pressure control either way during a single breath. There's bio-variable, which means that the ventilator rapidly or randomly changes inspiratory pressure. So it mimics the way you and I are breathing right now. Our tidal volumes are not consistent at all. There's servo targeting, which means that the inspiratory pressure is proportional to the patient's inspiratory effort. We mentioned this before on that graph with the ventilator work output versus the patient work output. Then the next higher level is called adaptive, which means that the ventilator adjusts targets by itself with changing patient conditions, usually patient lung mechanics. There can also be gas exchange targets. Then there's optimal targeting, which means that the ventilator does adaptive targeting in a particular way to either maximize or minimize some desired parameter. And there's only uh, two modes on the market right now that are uh, designed to use optimal targeting and they both um, minimize the power transfer from the ventilator to the patient. There were historical reasons for doing that because essentially that's what the brain does. It tries to minimize energy expenditure. But luckily it has turned out that um, power transfer is linked to ventilator induced lung injury. So we, it looks like that the most current research on the topic uh, seems to indicate that if you can minimize power transfer, you can also minimize the risk of ventilator induced lung injury. And finally, at the highest level, we have intelligent targeting, which simply means that the ventilator uses adaptive targeting and the tools of artificial intelligence, like rule-based expert systems, uh, mathematical models of physiology, uh, artificial neural networks, um, fuzzy logic, all kinds of things like that. And that is a wide open field for research. Now, I want to focus just on dual targeting for a minute because it's more common than you would think and causes a lot of confusion at the bedside because most clinicians don't take the time to read the operator's manual, right? What it means is that the key targets are operator preset, tidal volume, peak inspiratory, and inspiratory pressure. However, the ventilator then automatically switches between volume control and pressure control to meet these targets. And you can go, you can start off the breath with pressure control and switch to volume control, or you can start off in volume control and switch to pressure control. And there are examples of this that are commercially available. Now, taking a page out of the, um, the servo operator's manual, there's some nice graphics that illustrate this. And as you can see, there are at least three ventilators on the market that I know of that, that use this by default if you're not paying attention. So what happens is, again, if we look at how a breath is defined in terms of flow versus time, if there's no inspiratory effort, then the patient just gets to set flow and volume uh, as expected. And you would never know that dual targeting is involved. However, if the patient makes a small inspiratory effort during the inspiratory flow period, then the ventilator shortens the inspiratory flow time because 
as you will recall, the area between the flow and the time curve is volume. So if you add a little extra flow at the beginning, in the middle of the breath, then you have to shorten the inspiratory flow time to give you um, the set tidal volume. Finally, though, in the extreme case, if the patient makes a huge inspiratory effort, the ventilator notices this as a drop in inspiratory pressure. As we saw before in volume control, if P must goes up, P vent's got to go down. The ventilator sees that as a signal to switch out of volume control into pressure control. And the manual actually says it goes from a mandatory breath to a pressure support breath. And as we know, pressure support, so pressure support breaths are patient triggered and patient cycled. That means they're spontaneous breaths. And so this is actually not, this is control anymore, is it? It's not CMV, it's IMV. And not only that, but if you were in volume control because you wanted to enforce lung protective rules, guess what? They go out the window. The engineers have decided that comfort is the more important goal than safety. And this can frustrate some clinicians who insist on strict volume control, even in the face of high inspiratory effort, say a patient with, uh, with acidosis or something. And it may, and if you don't understand what the ventilator is doing, uh, you'd be hard pressed to explain it to the clinician why he wasn't getting the volume control that he wanted. And he may ask you to switch out the ventilator. Anyways, um, this mechanism, uh, this, this targeting scheme is the mechanism again for the type four IMV that I mentioned before. Very important to understand. Now we've made it all the way up through the 10 maxims. We're in a position to talk about a complete mode taxonomy and a mode classification has three components. The first is the control variable. The second is the breath sequence, as we saw before. And the third is the targeting scheme. And uh, the, the fellows at our institution made up a little um, way to memorize this. They call it I de boss. <laughs> and it's just the first letters of all those targeting schemes. So that might be some way for you to, to um, remember it. Sometimes I use this as a password. <laughs> In my computer's programs. Anyways, the mode tag or taxonomic attribute grouping is simply a series of letters. So we have pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation with set point targeting. The lowercase letter represents the targeting scheme. And in the case of IMV, there are two kinds of breaths, right? There are mandatory breaths, which is the first one, and there's spontaneous breaths, which is the second one. And this is the simplest case, two set point schemes. Modes are getting more and more complex. So you have multiple targeting schemes for both mandatory and spontaneous breath. So it does get to be complicated, but there's no way around it. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up pretty quick here. I wanna talk about resources that are available for um, learning this taxonomy and using it at the bedside. Um, at the Cleveland Clinic, we have developed a program that we call SEVA, which is Standardized Education for Ventilatory Assistance. If you go to this website, uh, you can uh, participate in this program for free. This is a self-study online course comprised of 12 modules. And you can see how each of these modules take you step-by-step step through the 10 maxims and up to actually learning how to read uh, graphic displays. Hey, Rob, I want to point out that we have also developed a free phone app. The phone app is basically the front end of a huge database. And the database is the classification of every mode on every ventilator that's used in the United States, which is a large number. Trust me, it's, it's a number well over 300 names of modes. And um, it's simplified by the use of this mode map. And the reason we do this is the same reason that we have um, a physician's desk reference for drugs, right? If you're not familiar with the ventilator, and particularly this is happening to respiratory therapists and other clinicians at the bedside, they're forced to use a ventilator they're not familiar with. And they're familiar with, let's say, PRVC, but the ventilator they have doesn't have PRVC. So how do you find the equivalent mode? Well, this is where an app like this comes into play. Hey, Rob, I'll just take you through a few of the screens. Yes? Yeah, I was going to say, me again? have you updated that yet, the, the mode map? Yes, it's completely updated. Now, now, I've been told that there may be some problems downloading it in other countries. I know that it's downloadable for both the iPhone and for the Android platform, and it's updated with the most recent ventilators except 
or maybe the one or two that came out in the last few few months. Um, if it's not yet available, uh, there, let me point out that you want to look for this this symbol here. The, yeah. You don't see this icon representing the ventilator mode map. And if it doesn't say Cleveland Clinic, then you have an older version, which is still valid. It just doesn't have the most recent <clears throat> ventilators that have come on the market in the last yep. two or three years, let us say. Hey, guys, I, I need to go. Sorry. Um, good to catch up. Yeah. Good to see you, Graham. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Graham. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask a couple questions at the end. And yeah, thank you. You do my job, right? right. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I will just take you through the screens real quick. If you were to download this, uh, there are two mo two ways of searching the database. The first is if you know the vendor and the model, and you want to do a mode search. Let's say you you're not familiar with the ventilator or the name of the mode, and you want to know what its tag is so that you can understand what it's doing. Then um, the other way to do it is um, if you know the tag and you want to know all the ventilators that have that mode. Two ways to do it. So let's start off with, uh, if you know the vendor, you type that in and you type in the model of the uh, ventilator that's made by that ventilator, by that vendor. And then you type in the mode name that you see on the ventilator screen. Mm -hmm. And then you press search. And bada bing, you get a nice little drawing of the ventilator and you get the mode tag. In this case, it's pressure control CMV with adaptive targeting. That's called pressure assist control plus volume guarantee. And this, this particular mode has a, about a half a dozen different names. It can be very confusing, right? Yeah. And then if you tap on this little key, then you can find comparable ventilators. And then you can scroll through a list of all the different ventilators that have modes with that same tag. Not that name necessarily, but with that, that classification of the ventilator. And then if you were to tap on any one of those, those pictures, you would see more information. Now, if you already know the mode tag and you want to find the mode names that go with that, you start with uh, entering um, the tag from a scrolling list. Um, you would select that and then you would tap the done box, then you tap go. And what you get is a scrolling list of all the ventilators that have modes with that tag. If you were to tap on one of those ventilators, for example, the Newport, you would get a little bit more information. You would get the name of the modes that are associated with that tag. So you can search the database forwards and backwards, if you will. Now I want to close by talking about how we use and how I suggest you use the taxonomy as the basis for education. Again, at our institution over the course of the last 10 years, we have evolved a progressive approach to training both um, um, medical residents and fellows in pulmonary and critical care medicine and also surgical residents, as well as uh, respiratory therapists. We are now making this mandatory for all respiratory therapists that work with ventilators in our ICUs. And you can see that it's composed of five different levels. The level one is we call save a theory. It's basically um, what I showed you today, an overview of the, the, um, the 10 maxims and a little bit about ventilator waveform graphics. Uh, level two is also a self-study program that uses um, a patient ventilator simulator that runs in Excel on your computer. So you don't need to be in a simulation lab. You don't even need a ventilator. You can do laboratory experiments, and that's what this is all about. You get a workbook, you get worksheets, and you get all these experiments you can do, making different settings on the ventilator, different modes, and seeing how patient ventilator interaction affects the ventilator graphics. Then once you've graduated from the theory part, you go into level three, which is live online proctored course. And we just did this yesterday, by the way, we did it in Zoom for about 70 people all at the same time. And that turned out to be quite successful and very well received. Um, also then uh, at level four, we progress to live training, in-person training at our simulation center. That's where we actually have ventilators connected to mannequins, uh, uh, tech, uh, connected to high level uh, breathing simulators. And we do various scenarios of different types of patient uh, standard situations like um, patients waking from anesthesia, patients with uh, acute asthma, uh, 
and, and patients with um, ARDS. And finally, at the highest level, which I will admit we have not yet developed, but we should have by the first quarter of next year, this is what we call the SEVA master level. We're going to talk about advanced waveforms, advanced modes like um, high frequency, and we'll also be talking about advanced monitoring like uh, end tidal CO2 and cap um, um, uh, capnography and uh, esophageal pressure monitoring and optimizing PEEP at the bedside. So that's that's going to be a very uh, cool, probably a two-day uh, course at, at the Sim Center. Another interesting thing that we do to keep this taxonomy uh, fresh in our fellows' minds is that once a week we do vent rounds in the ICU. And what happens then is we have a proctor, uh, one of the um, ICU staff members, usually it's the director of the ICU. He takes a half a dozen fellows or so, walks over to a, an actual patient, he asks them to go and look at the ventilator screen and, and tell them what is the mode tag just by looking at the ventilator graphics. Then look at the patient and look at the mode uh, and tell us what are the goals of ventilation for the patient. And we say there are only three goals, safety, meaning gas exchange and, and lung protective ventilation. There's comfort, which means uh, avoidance of synchrony problems between the patient and the ventilator, including work shifting. And finally, there's liberation, meaning getting the patient off the ventilator as quick as possible. And then we ask them, well, given what you think is the goal of ventilation, is the mode on this patient the best one? And if, if not, what mode would you use? And once you get the appropriate mode, are the settings optimized in terms of um, safety, comfort, and liberation? And I can tell you, you can walk into any ICU anywhere in the world, pick any patient at random, and you can always do something better, right? In terms of looking at um, the patient ventilator interaction in these terms. And we found this to be tremendously helpful. The residents and fellows uh, learn the nomenclature, they can apply this. And, and after two or three years of a fellowship, they can conduct ventilator rounds themselves, amazingly enough. It's been hugely successful. I want to talk a little bit about Save a Sim Day at the Simulation Center. We have six skill stations for different modes. We have different kinds of simulations with, uh, with both regular mannequins and um, breathing simulator. And that's a very well uh, attended thing. So anyways, I hope I have convinced you of um, the importance of this new paradigm. And I, I would be very happy to answer any questions at this point. Fantastic. Let me uh, see if I can uh, get this. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, that was very, very informative. And it's really something that's needed. Um, I, I think you, you know, as you continue to join us, you should keep us up to date on your progression towards uh, level five SIVA. That would be interesting for us yeah. to follow. And I do uh, completely agree with the idea of safety, comfort, and liberation as our, our goals for mechanical ventilation. Uh, one question, have you received much support from the ventilator manufacturers embracing this, this taxonomy or this methodology? Yes, I have received support from two of them. Actually, three. I, I don't want to name names. Um, no, one just... of them came to me and I helped them write one of their little manuals about modes of ventilation and they, they did that because they recognized that their fleet of ventilators had gotten so diverse that they themselves were contradictory in terms of the names of modes that they had. Now they did not fully embrace the taxonomy and I understand why because it's a huge shift. It's very difficult for manufacturers to retool and, and, re, and change the way they think about their modes, their training force and, and, and people like you understand how difficult it is and most of the training in the world is not done in schools. It's done by ventilator representatives and clinical specialists. It's difficult to get them to change their paradigm. Um, and, and frankly, there's, there's um, not much motive. You know, when, when it comes to actually naming modes, I don't have a problem with them coming up with creative names. That's how you sell product. But when you write in the manual what the mode does and the, and the terms that you use in your glossary, that's where I think manufacturers can all get on the same page and that would benefit everyone. It would help 
uh, clinical specialists sell ventilators if they can communicate more appropriately with, with their, their market. Another manufacturer actually was starting to use the terms in their glossary and some of the tables of their modes. They, just, they use some of the nomenclature that I have. Uh, a couple of manufacturers have actually adopted the term continuous spontaneous ventilation versus spont or some other uh, arbitrary term. Uh, so yeah, I'm seeing progress, but it's, it's like turning the Titanic, right? And, I, I, and it's, it's, the change is not gonna be driven by manufacturers. The change is gonna be driven by end users, yep. in particular, the educators, right? People who are out there training, peop, uh, respiratory therapists in North America and um, fellows in medical programs throughout the world. Now at the Cleveland Clinic, like other hospitals, we are an international hospital. We train dozens and dozens of, of physicians that go out all over the world and many of them have adopted this and are using it to train their fellows in other countries. So um, that's how it's gonna diffuse. That's how we're gonna disseminate this information. A Couple more questions, sorry to hog all the time. But um, I, I know on your 2007 article, the, one of the first ones uh, on the taxonomy of ventilation, you had pointed out uh, the impact that using a taxonomy would have on uh, potential sales on education and on patient care from a risk standpoint. And uh, I guess this really isn't a question, it's, it's actually a admission that uh, as a ventilator manufacturer, I was deeply concerned, particularly at that time, with increasing errors at the bedside. And I saw not changing names or trying even to impose new ATS you know, descriptions for, for breath types or breath things as a potential risk, because I wanted to make sure that people who were using, um, you know, my 7200s were happy then to make the transfer to the 840, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And so I internally found myself at odds with the engineers and even with some of the, the PhD uh, physiologists that we employed who really wanted to change the names of things uh, to be more uh, ideal in terms of physiology. And I, I could agree with them there, but I was deeply concerned about that. And I was also concerned about uh, the impact it would have on my sales. And what I mean by that is if now I am employing salespeople to go and be educators, then they're not selling for me. And therefore I'm taking a beating. I'm worried about risk. So that was a, I, I had followed you for, uh, in your philosophy here for quite some time and, and totally agreed and embraced it. Uh, so I, again, that wasn't a question as much as just an admission. Yeah, and, and I, I agree 100%. And another thing that's very frustrating to people that are trying to sell ventilators is that their R&D programs spend millions of dollars inventing newer modes that are more robust in terms of serving those three goals, right? Safety, comfort, and liberation. They're adding more um, automation. And and what is still the most popular mode in the world? The simplest mode there is. Volume assist control, volume CMV. And that, that must make you crazy. <laughs> that you, you got a Ferrari and the guy buys it and he never takes it out of first gear. <laughs> and that has to speak to safety. Now, proving that in terms of research is gonna be impossible. We, in the 50 years or so that I've been involved in respiratory care research, there's never been a convincing uh, set of studies that prove that one mode is any better than the other, with the possible exception, exception of high frequency ventilation versus volume assist control. You couldn't get two more different modes, and yet there's only evidence for premature infants, and it doesn't seem to work for adults, and I think that, again, has to do with uh, improper technology, but um, the point is we can't wait for physicians who say, well, show me the evidence and then I'll use these new modes. Yeah. You have to go on first principles, right? You have to go on what's theoretically gonna work and then use your bedside skills to determine whether or not the mode is serving the goals. And I'm here to tell you that volume control, CMV does not serve all patients' goals. Right. I mean, to some extent, that question that you posed to your uh, fellows about what is the best mode Myself personally, I, I would have answered that is the one I best understand. The one I completely, you know. There's always that, right? Yeah, the one I, I, I really know what I'm doing with. 
But uh, my last question is, if a ventilator manufacturer wanted to reach out to you and get their ventilator on the TAG uh, program, uh, how would they do that? Or how would a, you know, a new ventilator company um, get on that program? Well, um, I have been contacted. I, as I said at the beginning, I am a consultant. I have done this kind of work. But uh, hopefully moving forward, I would be happy to work with anybody, not just ventilator manufacturer, but educators, right? Researchers mm -hmm. um, and clinicians. So uh, you can post my personal email. It's very simple, robert.chatburn at gmail.com. And I will respond to all queries. Very good, Robert. Well, uh, again, welcome to, to the group. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, sorry to keep you up so late. Uh, and um, we look forward to uh, having you, you know, join the team and, and look forward to uh, you providing more uh, guidance to us. So Great. thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And we always end this with a uh, simple sentence, breathe easy. <laughs> <laughs>